Oh, if the old fox had only known that all he was doing was assisting the rabbit toward life. That old fox, man, he just hated that rabbit. Kept him up at night dreaming of ways that he could torture him, you know, if he ever, if he ever managed to catch him. I know how he'd make that rabbit regret the day that he was born. And then one day the old fox hatched a plan even too cunning for Br'er Rabbit and when he caught him he was almost out of his mind with excitement losing count of the ways he was dreaming to kill him but as the old fox was considering all these different agonizing options Br'er Rabbit spots a briar patch a briar patch with thorns and thistles so long and so sharp they'd they'd surely not only end a rabbit's life, but adequately torture him on the way. I could, I could knock his head clean off. Oh, Mr. Fox, Br'er Rabbit pleaded. Yes, knock my head clean off. Just, just don't throw me in that briar patch. Maybe I'll hang him. Oh, Mr. Fox, hang me, yes. If you would only be so kind, anything... But the briar patch, I know I'll, I'll skin him alive. Oh, Mr. Fox, if your, if your kindness could only be stretched toward that, just anything, anything at all, just not that briar patch. What briar patch, screams the fox as he catches sight of it. The thorns almost glistening sharp, piercing, agonizing, torturous briar patch. You wouldn't throw me in there, would you? Asked the rabbit. Again, the fox looks over at what promises to be the single most brutal, extreme, excruciating means of execution that anyone could ever dream. And with wild abandon, and an unquenchable thirst to see his little enemy suffer, the fox hurls Br'er Rabbit up in the air, right into the middle of the briar patch toward unimaginable, inconceivable, unparalleled in the world of foxes and rabbits, pain and death. And then nothing, silence, Then rabbit sniggering. Then rabbit laughter. Then rabbit singing. <laughs> I was born and raised <laughs> in the briar patch. <laughs> oh, if the old fox had only known that all he was doing was assisting the rabbit toward life, away from death, the briar patch would have been the last thing that he'd have done. Genesis 7 introduces the number 40 to us. For 40 days and 40 nights I will send rain upon the earth. From here, scripture, the number would come to take on a meaning of its own, typically in reference to times of testing or trial or even refining like a goldsmith or a silversmith might do. Moses spends 40 days on the mountain with God, 
which means the idolaters at the bottom spend 40 days without him. And so Moses would go through his refining on the mountain in front of the bush, while the idolaters would get their refining when Moses got back. Israel's spies were sent out to spy the land, you remember, and after 40 days, they come back and they report that the land cannot be taken. So Israel was made to walk 40 years in the wilderness in order to refine from her a new faithful generation. One year for every faithless day they'd spent spying out the land. Israel were being, or Israel was being uncreated. The first walk through the wilderness had God miraculously feeding them, clothing them, not now. That act of creative benevolence would now be withheld from them until a new generation, a new man, a new Israel had been created. Forty days and then destruction, Jonah warned Nineveh. And as you know, that 40-day warning refined a new heart within the people of Nineveh, uh, Nineveh toward God. Prior to entering his ministry, Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness fasting in what appears to be uh, a final stage of refining, of preparation. Hebrews 5.8 tells us that he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And given that we can, we can barely miss a meal without counting it as suffering, I think we can conclude that 40 days would be something of a task. So when we arrive at the flood and observe the global scale of this calamity being unleashed upon the earth, Scripture does not permit us to understand it as some type of divine hissy fit. It's a global cleansing. The earth is being passed through the fire. It's a global refinement. God hasn't given up on the human family and he proves it by saving it through Noah and his family who were saved through the old the old boy's technique of sometimes it's who you know that counts. So when the waters arrive, what looks like destruction and only destruction is actually salvation. As Peter will point out, they're being baptized. Same with Israel having to walk through the desert until every one of them dies. It looks like destruction. It isn't. It's salvation. Psalm 22, that famous psalm that Jesus quotes from the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That has some people concluding that God abandoned Jesus on the cross. Personally, I can think of few things more terrifying than God abandoning his own obedient, faithful, sinless son. Especially as the son himself says, I always do what is pleasing to my father. So you know the teaching that, you know, that almost presents Jesus and the father at odds with each other. Here's God desperate to satisfy his lust for justice by avenging his holy honor and he would have gotten away with it too if it hadn't been for his pesky kid kind of presents God with a zeal 
to destroy us, but has Jesus getting in the way? Paul would deal with this with the simple words of God is for us. In any event, the very Psalm Jesus quotes in verse 22 says, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. So all this, the father turned his face away from Jesus, silliness that you'll often hear. It appears to me that if the father did turn away from Jesus, then it would be curious at best and downright senseless at worst for Jesus to specifically choose a psalm to describe what was going on that in its entirety teaches the exact opposite of being abandoned by God. Rather, I believe the psalm is making the point that I'm trying to make that God's world is upside down. Well, God's world is the right way up. Our world is upside down. <clears throat> so much so that we have to be taught that the way up is down. The least are the greatest. Wealth is poverty. Mourning is joyful. The masters are the servants. To live is to die and to die is to live. In fact, so emphatic is Jesus on this. <clears throat> if you're ever puzzled, or if you're ever unsure of what the will of God is for you, try and figure out what the world thinks and do the opposite. Because the chances of the world choosing a good or godly path whilst willfully denying his existence and willfully resisting or refusing him are practically nil or lower. Rather, I believe the psalmist teaching as he opens with Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, why hast thou forsaken me? but ends the psalm in praise. I think the psalmist is saying in his own way, whatever he was going through at the time, you think this is defeat? You think this is abandonment? You think I'm a, vic a victim here? This is victory. And I am the victor. Yeah, I know it looks hopeless. I know it looks like abandonment. But you're wrong. He has not hidden his face. He has listened to his cry. This is not destruction. This is salvation. Which, of course, is the very essence of the cross. Looks like defeat. It looks like loss. It looks like destruction. But it's salvation. And just like the old fox, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 8 tells us that if the rulers had known what they were doing, they would not have crucified them. because it was the crucifixion that granted him the victory and the last thing they wanted for him was the victory. All they were doing in their opposition to God was carrying out the will of God. They didn't know this. If they'd known this, they wouldn't have done it. Luke 
Look, God's will, God's will is going to be accomplished. Period. Now, he can do that with us, or he can do that in spite of us. And we get to choose which. But it's going to get done. His will will out. And so bizarre is the crucifixion and, and leading up to it. In fact, if you look closely enough between the lines in the gospel, you can almost hear Jesus saying, Oh, yes, 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 Mr. Fox, anything. Just don't put me on that cross. <laughs> So as they schemed behind the closed doors and whispered their whispers in cold, dark corridors where they thought no one could hear them, drooling over their brilliant and cunning plan on the best way to kill him, a way to provide the most excruciating pain and humiliation so that his followers would take note, they choose the cross upon which the curse of God himself rested. <clears throat> so what does Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani mean? Well, probably lots of things. But as they did their best to annihilate him and torture him and ruin him and cause him as much pain as possible, Then what do we do? The idiots that we are, what do we do? We toss them onto a cross and then toss them into a tomb. And then nothing. Nothing. And then divine sniggering. And then divine laughing. And then divine singing. I was born and raised. <laughs> I was born and raised in the briar patch. This, this, this is what you've come up with to end me? You thought this would stop me? A tomb? <laughs> this is the way, the way that you chose? You thought to defeat me with lies? You believed you could end me with death? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. So again, the flood is not a divine hissy fit. If God could restrain himself and did while we brutalized and murdered his son, I'm pretty sure that he's capable of doing it in Genesis 7. The flood is a response, a measured response, a redemptive response, and it's a global spanking on the human family's backside. And it says things. The world has a, has a baptism to undergo whereby she'll come out the other side, a better man, refined, not a perfect man. And sometimes we'd be, for, we'd be forgiven for thinking that nothing changed, but lots of things changed. That God demonstrated his love for us in the flood has sobered the minds of millions down through history. So the flood speaks way beyond its own circumstance. God is choosing to refine, to renew, to cleanse the world. And how does he do it? He does it by uncreating the world. We're told in Genesis 1 that he created the world by separating the waters. Now he's ending the world by bringing all the waters back in a reversal, in an act of uncreation. 
He sends the waters back over the face of the earth, where his spirit will now once again hover, or a dove. And this, this wilderness of suffering, this wilderness of seemingly aimless, floating, wandering, this will this will come to be one of the hallmarks of God's people. I already mentioned Moses going through the wilderness of 40 days on Sinai. This would be following his 40 years in the wilderness tending the sheep. And Israel's 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. John the Baptist also emerges from the wilderness. Jesus, of course, emerges from the wilderness. In opposition to any type of prosperity gospel, you know the, you know the kind, the the kind that seems to teach that God's purpose for us here on earth is to skate through on a wave of prosperity, health, and blessing and happiness. In opposition to that nonsense, stands a cross. It's a crucified Lord we worship. Whose early followers passed through many fires, floods, and wildernesses of their own to reach their promised land. Peter has this to say about it all. <clears throat> Beloved, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has taken place among you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you're blessed. Because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, a criminal, or even as a mischief maker. But if any of you suffer as a Christian, do not consider it a disgrace. But glorify God because you bear this name. For the time has come for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the end for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinners? Therefore, let those suffering in accordance with God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while continuing to do good. Our day will come when through our own wildernesses we'll have wandered. To reach upon the boundaries of our promised land the world in in all her genius and her scheming will take us and cast us into the grave and then nothing And then sniggering and then laughing and then we'll join the eternal chorus in joyful praise singing <laughs> we were born <laughs> we were born and raised in the briar patch thoughts comments questions